your Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. We are local talk radio. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. Joining me here in the studio this morning from far north tactical, we have one of the sponsors of the show, Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And from uh, the other sponsor, Bighorn Enterprises, we have Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. All right. What is on the docket this morning? How are we going to wake up today? I don't know. I figured after last week's show we'd all be rested, so <laughs> didn't think about anything for today. Come on, Aaron. Your brain. Well, I, I've I've got something to prime the pump, if you'd like. The uh, you know obviously one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with here in Alaska is the high cost of energy, and it seems like an awful lot of people are looking to government for solutions because. Quite honestly, a lot of the problems have been caused by government. One of the reasons why the price of energy is so high is because of the restrictions that have been placed on what kind of energy can enter the market. And when I say what kind of energy, I mean if you look at producing electricity, it, it, you, it, you can't open a coal plant, you can't go out and build one without having the federal government descend on you with all kinds of fines. And in order to get it built in the first place, you have to comply with all of these regulations, this and that. They are making it impossible for new power to enter the grid on the one hand, and that's that's what we're talking about, electrical power. If you talk about actual burning of fossil fuels to keep you warm, the taxes, I mean, the greedy bastards in the Alaska legislature won't even suspend the eight cents per gallon tax on gasoline. Why not? Because they use those monies for roads, and we wouldn't want to give that up. We're flush with cash. And they can't give up eight cents a gallon. Well, they're not gonna. Why would they? Well, they think it's their money. Well, exactly. All right. You no, owe it to them. That's transportation, obviously, not the actual burning of uh, fuel oil in your tank. However, look at the additives that have been put in. Look at all the different issues that, w- without our consent, without our permission, without even consulting us, the elected officials have been doing to make our energy more expensive. So let's say, all right, well, we're going to go ahead and burn wood then because it is one of the most cost-effective ways of keeping your home warm in the wintertime, which, by the way, thank you, global warming. It is snowing again this morning, March 31st, and we've already got close to an inch on the ground just since last night. Thank you, Mother Nature, for making me realize why I love Alaska so much. I mean, think about what happens now if you go out and try to burn wood. You've got these local officials over there at the borough telling us that in order to comply with the EPA, they are going to have to regulate us and what we burn and how we burn it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no such thing as global warming, Steve. There's only extreme climate change. Oh, well, they have to keep on changing the definition of what they're trying to alarm us about because unless there's an emergency, they don't have the power to step in and tell us what to do because we're going to tell them to go pound sand. No, we wouldn't. We never do. I, this whole thing, everything you just were talking about, is going back to what we try to explain, open people's eyes up to, the difference between political laws and <laughs> political <laughs> law and common law um, and liberty versus permissions. I'm going to read a little bit out of uh, Whatever Happened to Liberty, which, again, stress... Read the book. If you haven't read it, go who's read it. it. Who's whatever by? happened to justice is whatever, what he's. Whatever happened to justice or yeah, whatever, whatever happened. Whatever happened to justice. By Richard Mayberry. Fantastic book. If you just read, if you just would get through this, if you don't understand, I know a lot of people do, but if you don't understand what we're talking about, this book would just be like, boop, the light bulb would be open, everything would make sense, or at least a lot more. So he says today's laws assume rights can be granted by the government. However. What the government gives, it can also take away. So under political law, we have no real rights, no real liberties, only permissions. We do not have freedom of speech. We have permission to speak. We do not have freedom of the press. We have permission to publish. Whatever free trade we have left is only permission to trade. These permissions can be revoked any time the power holders decide to revoke them. Majority rule. That goes with the wood stove. Do you have the right to heat your home? No. No. You have permission to heat your home, and they decide what you can heat it with because you do not fundamentally have the right to heat your home the way that you want to. 
only if they allow you to. Everything that you do is only by permission. Everything we do. I was allowed, I was given permission to drive down here with a driver's license. I was given permission to drive here with in the car because I registered it. I was given permission, you were given permission to go over the airwaves because you have a license with the FCC. I have permission to speak right now only if I say the right things and don't go overboard. I mean, some of the things I want to say, I know I better not because I don't have permission to say that. So everything that we do, we have no liberty here. We talk about the freest country in the world, which is a joke because the freest country in the world wouldn't have the most political prisoners of the world, which is what we have, more prisoners than anywhere else in the world. The next five nations combined, combined. I believe. We are a country of permissions, We and we've allowed it. You go hunting, you get permission before you go. You go buy a gun, you get permission before you go. You go cross a river, you better get permission before you go. Every little aspect of every part of our lives is permission. You go to church, you get permission from the state to have a church. Otherwise, they'll tax you. I mean, the other side of it, if you don't get permission, you get taxed or thrown in jail. Everything we do here. So how much liberty do we have? Every single thing that you do, you have to get permission from what the about, state. Right, what about can. the Bill of Rights? What about the Constitution? You always hear people saying, but the Constitution guarantees this. The Constitution guarantees that. The Bill of Rights makes it possible for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What about the Second Amendment? If we didn't have that, then we would all be... <laughs> In, we, we wouldn't have any freedoms at all. We have to defend it. We have to we have to join this political group and to donate that money to this other group to con continue to like protect said, our constitution. You have to have permission to have the gun. You have to have permission to get a political party. You have to have permission to assemble. Be a part, yeah. Be a part of the political process. You have to get permission to do that. Everything we do, you have to get permission. We are not free. I, and what, story. If, what if you don't get permission? What if you do something like the Occupy Fairbanks people did and well, just go down and start doing it? Luckily for them, hats off, luckily for them right now, our borough doesn't have the policing powers or capability or whatever to go and throw them in a cage. If they did, they would do just like everywhere else in the United States where they maced them and beat them and threw them in a But look at how yeah. many other people here, our fellow citizens, are calling for them to be thrown out of that park. Yeah. I, I mean, I this week, I some of the people here at the radio station went down there to try to stir up some, well, I, I'll be quite honest, I think they went down there to just try to stir up some trouble, because the last couple of times they drove by, they didn't see anybody there at the tent, therefore they made the dots connect, and they said, ah, they must not actually be there, they're not really occupying anything, so they went down there to take some pictures and prove that they weren't there, and of course, when they went to the main tent, it was empty. And while they were in that main tent, they heard someone calling out, Yoo-hoo, from the other tent. <laughs> so they realized that there was someone actually there. That didn't, however, stop them from uh, putting up their own signs, humor signs, things like free tent. They put up a protest, along with the other protest signs, they put up mm -hmm. a, a protest sign that said free tent. They had put up another one that said, I'm, whatever it is, I'm against it. I mean, they were making light of the protest that, Fairbank, that Occupy Fairbanks is going on. And you know what? That's fine. Uh, I, the, the whole point of free speech is that you're supposed to be free to be able to say what you want, except here's this group that because people don't agree with what they're saying, the right. everyday people are trying to get them thrown out of the park. Well, I think mostly those people that are trying to get them thrown out of the park are just a bunch of sissies, basically. Because these guys are standing up for something they believe in, and they're going down, and they're... And you know what? We don't... Well, the, the local guys, we've all met them. We've talked to them. They're a little bit different than the national guys. Um, for the most part, I do not agree with their philosophy on free market, okay? But I fully support the fact that they can go down there and protest. They should be down there protesting. Everyone should be glad that they're protesting. I can't... I don't remember exactly what the Jefferson what Jefferson quote was about <coughs> protest or a little revolution. He said it, he said that, uh, I'm going to have to paraphrase. Basically it's good to have a little protest. Even, 
even if it's wrong, he said a lot of times it's gonna they're gonna be wrong minded in it, but he'd rather see someone out there protesting the government than not have it at all. And that's what we're, that should be our attitude with them, because they're saying screw you, we're gonna come out here because we have the right. We don't have permission to be here, but we have the right, and here we are. We're and not so, leaving. Well, they should have to pull a permit like everybody else, Josh. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing that drives me nuts with people that say, man, you just throw them out of there. You bunch of sissies. Because it's not fair. We don't have the right to do that. Well, that's well, the biggest thing I've heard is that they should make them have to have a permit to be there. Yeah, because yeah. they don't have the right. Well, they don't you, have the right. Why do you not have the right to be there? What makes you think that you don't have the right? Because somebody making rules for recess said, you must not protest between this hour and that hour. And well, you say, okay, okay, teacher. What's the, I've heard people call your show during the week, Steve, and they say, yeah, that... Them uh, people that are down there, it's a disgrace because that's the veterans' part. Uh, yeah, the oh, veterans. I, that makes like, me crazy. What the heck? What are these veterans supposedly fighting for? The right to redress. The right to petition the government. No, but, no apparently, we, apparently not. Uh, well, I mean, I, I've heard from some. I, I've only heard from one actual veteran that has been critical of them. Most of the veterans that I've heard from are very supportive of their right to be there be, precisely for that reason. That's that because they... The reason why they donned the uniform in the first place was to stand up for, put their life on the line for the freedoms that we su- were supposed to have in this country. In fact, you, you give an oath when you don that uniform for the first time that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And part of somehow that has gotten twisted in people's minds so that if you don the uniform, you are to be respected for no other reason than simply because you are donning the uniform. Ooh, that 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 bothers me because if you're not defending the Constitution, I don't care what uniform you have on, all you're wearing is a costume. Yeah. Well, I think you're right, too. I haven't actually heard any uh, military veterans call in. No, that, no yeah, part, of, that are part of this is on Facebook, too. because uh, yeah, I, I heard, in fact, on that same Facebook post that I saw, they were highly critical of you, Aaron, for selling supplies to the military because they believe you're just in it to, quote, make money off the military. No, I sell stuff to the military to get poor. You sell it to get poor? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I mean, you don't make a heck of a lot of money doing it. I don't make a heck of a lot of the money, but that's beside the point. If I did, why, I mean... Let's say I did. So? Yeah. <laughs> right. So that means that means that people who have restaurants that are open for military, they're just open in order to make money off the military because military people come in there, right? And they shouldn't they shouldn't have a restaurant because military people come in and right. they're just they're just in business to make money off the military. You know, I guess you could say that for every single business in this town, then, couldn't you? Right. I don't even feel like defending myself on that. I think um, <laughs> you don't have to. Josh uh, has the best point. And anybody that sits there and thinks to themselves that we need to vote this or vote that, or, I mean, like last Monday, uh, Steve and I were talking about uh, how so many people are anybody but Obama. I was voting in anybody but Obama change the fact that every aspect of your life is controlled by regulatory law. I don't believe it changes that at all. In fact, all it does is, I'm not even sure it changes the regulations. Or I right, doesn't so change the, anything. The, what kind of differences do we have under Obama from Bush? None, because bureaucracy never changed. Did the bureaucracy from Bush to Obama change? I don't believe it did. No, I mean, a couple of people at the top are different. But the individual people, I mean, how do you get a career in government 20 or 30 years if it's all political appointments? You you can't. Obviously, you have to be able to float like Flotsam and Jepsen on the sea of politics. 458 yeah, Talk you're not, you're not gonna get is the number. we got a couple lines on hold. You ready to go to the phones? Why? Does he have... Who is it? Does he got permission to call here? I, I don't know. We can check and see. Did he buy his permit? All right. Good morning, caller. Do you have your permit to call in this morning? Uh, yeah, I checked with the borough, and it was totally fine. Uh, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you got? Who is name, this? Name, rank, and serial number. Uh, wait, all, all I need is a first <laughs> okay. name. Wait, who is this? What's your name? Uh, this is Rob. Rob, what's on your mind? <laughs> hey, you know, you, you brought up a couple of points that that I kind of want to make. When uh, First of all, when we buy gas, how much gas are we actually buying? Because, 
you know, you put gas in your car and you smell it, and it doesn't smell like the gasoline I was raised with. You know, and they, they put all these additives in there, so if we're putting stuff in our car and, you know, sucking the vip the uh, the vipers out of whatever comes out of the fuel tank when you're putting your petroleum in there, what are we really inhaling? <laughs> Am I right? Is this stuff bad for us to breathe when we're putting it in our car? I wouldn't I, I wouldn't breathe it in, <laughs> intentionally if I were you. No, no, no. I mean, I, I'm not going to go around and, you know... Uh, what do they call it? Huffing on gasoline by no means, but you know what I'm talking about. You, you know, you put the spout in the car, and every once in a while you get a whiff of, you know, gasoline going in there, and says, "What kind of gasoline is this? What are we actually buying?" That's one point. And two, um, I am a, I am a veteran, and I raised heck with the borough about the tents being set up at the, the veterans memorial. And the next thing I go, within 45 minutes, here's Sergeant Sedanko from the Fairbanks Police Department um, telling me not to raise too much hell burrow over the tents. And I just said, well, okay, why don't we put the tents over there in in front of where you work there at the police department? (laughs) He just kind of laughed, and he says, well, I don't think that's going to happen. And uh, I really got my face put in the snow over that, and I, I really had to back away from it because the borough did not like what I told them. Why Why were you opposed to them putting up the tents? Well, I'm not opposed to putting up the tents. But, I mean, here's the tents that that your corporation went over the other day and there's nobody there. But but they were there. They just weren't out visibly raising hell about being there. They were there quietly. Well, you know, I, I mean, I understand their point, but that bet, that bet, that Veterans Memorial is for the, the people who has died for this country. And I just don't understand why it's littered with, um, it, it's just littered with tents. I, whoa, 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 I, whoa, whoa. What are, are, are okay, I got to ask you, brother, are you smoking something? No, sir. Okay, because I, it is not littered with tents. There are two tents on that entire park. It, it, that park is still available for anybody who wants to go over there and use it. What, have you gone there, or are you, are, are you just getting worked up about something that doesn't really infect you at all? No, 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 no. I I, I went by there yesterday, and there's survey tape all over. Uh, everything's marked. Everything looks neat, but I, I, I just think that... Uh, my opinion, I don't think what's going on there is a very good image for the downtown district. Why not? Hmm. I just don't agree with the tents being up what, there. what if okay, let me let me let me flip it around. What if it was a group of veterans who, in order to make a point about their service, were redressing the government about another issue, for instance, say about their pensions benefits. The benefits. Like benefits, yeah, like benefits that they were promised that they never got. Would you well, support that? Yes, I would. Okay. You know? Do you remember what happened in uh, what year was it that they that they ran down the veterans in Washington D.C.? Uh, what I year guess. was that? 1920 something. <laughs> right after the revolution. No, no. Nine, well, yeah, no. There was, the, there, was, there was that issue too. The whiskey was that. The, that wasn't the whiskey rebellion. What was that? Shays rebellion. I think it was Shays. There's Shays rebellion in which that happened, where veterans who were promised benefits were not only denied the benefits, they were physically, forcibly put down by the federal government, and that was right after the revolution. That was like 1780 something, and right. then again in 1920s after uh, World War One, the veterans that had been promised benefits went to Washington, D.C. and sent up, set up tents right there on the National Mall, and a man by the name of MacArthur, wasn't it, Douglas MacArthur, who helped run down, yep. actually physically beat down the veterans who were there to protest. Now, you would you would support the veterans protesting. Why would you not support someone else protesting? Well, you know what, Steve, what's going to happen when the, when the veterans' wall comes in the town next weekend after next? Um, I think those guys down there will be quite respectful, and they're not going to do anything to it. I guess our point is, if you don't stand for those guys to have the right to protest, then you can't really stand for anyone. Or if 
let's say you're part of a group where you're a veteran and you decided you wanted to go protest, you would want those guys backing you up. It takes well, everyone to back back it up. We need but to be... Was, but, but if I was protesting, I'd be down there with a, with a stick and a board on it. Well, everyone does things a little bit different. Some people go about it by voting or going down to the borough assembly. I mean, at least these guys, one thing they're doing is they're getting people talking. They've got their well, message out there. People are, if they were protesting at the, if they were under the bridge over here, no one would pay much attention to them. Right, a lot of people that go down the borough and give testimony have the have the feeling that people that don't show up and go down there really have no say in anything and have no right to complain. Here's what... Um, I'll go back to probably what you you and I probably agree on. We don't agree necessarily with what those guys are for, right? Um, uh, no, I, I you know they they've got their point and they've made their yeah. point. Well, this is this was the what Jefferson when I was talking about earlier. I couldn't remember, but I finally found it. The spirit of resistance to government is so valuable on certain occasions that I wish it always to be kept alive. Now, this is the part that I think you and I and all of us need to take in it will often be exercised when wrong but better so than not be exercised at all and well, well spoken so that was thomas jefferson not me by <laughs> but anyways i just <laughs> but I'm at just least josh that. you know how to read and i appreciate you reading well, that's that. where i'm coming from i guess that's where mm-hmm. we're coming from is that it's better even if they're wrong at least they're resisting Something. well the reason uh, yeah i understand but now, I, I, i'll be real I'd be real interested to see what happens when the veterans' wall goes in there, and uh, uh, this kind of lets you know. Somebody told me that was going to happen like in two weeks. So, well, I'm, I, I, normally the veterans' wall comes up in the sem- in the summertime, uh, not 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 when there's still snow on the ground. So I'm not sure on the date on when it's going to be here, uh, but I'm I'm fairly certain that it's going to be able to coexist. Let me ask you another question. Actually, two two, uh, two questions. One question Proceed. is this: uh, Would you? be more comfortable if they were protesting someplace else? Is it the location that's bothering you? It's the location. I okay. think that's what most most what most people is, no. the location. I would say, I'm sure as a veteran, you probably have some grievances with your government, with this government. Um, I think it'd be really cool if you gather up a couple hundred veterans and go out and stand Maybe not right next to those guys, but having a little protest for on your of yourself. Mm-hmm. I might I might join that one. I mean, a as, as a protest. veteran, I don't feel that I've gotten everything that I was promised by my yeah, Well, and even the veterans now are getting not even a third of what they were. They're getting the shaft mm-hmm. right now. They're getting the shaft. They are indeed. No, they are, and uh, it's uh, it's too bad because you know they when you know when everybody went in, well, we're going to promise you this, this, and this, and now there seems to be problems, huh. but it's always but, odd to me uh, when the government lies. What the government? The, the government doesn't lie. No, the <laughs> government never, never knew. lies. Brother, but, I appreciate your phone call. Thanks very much for calling in and being a part of the discussion today. Hey, th- thank you, gentlemen, for 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 what you guys do all the time. I'm I'm I listen to you all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, and by the way, appreciate lest it. we forget, thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. 458-TALK is the number. Let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more here before the news at the bottom of the hour. Good morning. Who's this? Hi. Good morning. This is Terry. Terry, what's on your mind? Well, first of all, since it came up, I'm a veteran myself. I'm also now a senior citizen, but I'll tell you one thing. You can take the kid out of the military, but if he's any good, you can't take the military out of the kid. And I would just love to come down there and kick some ass amongst you idiot civilians who don't know shoe polish from something else by golly don't you understand that protest and free speech are not synonyms for camping all right let me are you aware that i'm a veteran sir are you good thank you uh but still nonetheless nonetheless on that and let me ask you speech and protest are not synonyms for camping and neither is shoe polish a synonym for service. <laughs> well, you missed the analogy, uh, but I won't go into well, that. Well, most military boys wouldn't understand that analogy anymore because they don't wear pressed uniforms and don't have uh, polishable shoes anymore. Hmm. That's right. They that, don't even. They can't even polish their boots anymore at all. The new uniform design does not permit polishing or or pressing of the no. uniform. It is quite true that uh, with the current uh, whatever they call it, the last I heard was BDUs. 
battle dress uniform. Uh, it's true that the boots are now suede. By the way, as they were in the South Pacific in World War II, they were also suede, uh, and you can't polish them. And by the way, they don't even make Shinola shoe polish anymore. Uh, the item that Shinola was <laughs> compared with is still, of course, frequent. Uh, you know what? There's quite a bit of that out there, as a matter of fact, and I think that an awful lot of people would prefer <laughs> to put that uh, out there instead of the Shinola. I, I, th- let, me, and let me say this. I do appreciate your service to the country. Thank uh, you. But and let me ask you one other question, though. It, it, what did you fight for? America. Okay. Did you fight That's... for the nation or did you fight for the ideals? Well, they are supposed to be the same thing. Ah, let's address that on the other side of the break. 458 Talk is the number. Is America synonymous with the ideals of America? If you haven't seen the uh, Disney version of Robin Hood, there's the, uh, during this song, all the people that could not pay their taxes have been thrown into the jail and can see them all shuffling along in the chain gang to go out and do the work that's been given to them by the sheriff to do. But that has absolutely nothing to do with America. The question that was posed right before the break with uh, our, our caller sounded like a veteran of uh, possibly World War II uh, was, is America synonymous with the idea of America. If you don the uniform and you go out and you fight for your country, is that the same as going out and fighting for the ideals of America, i.e. the Constitution of the United States, the principles of freedom and liberty? And and if it is the same, then what about the people you're fighting against? Are they not just simply fighting for their country? Are are they not simply fighting? I, I mean, and, and and well, today our wars are about fighting for our government, the the government, not for the ideal of America. <laughs> There's a difference between the country, the people, and the government. That's two separate things. The government can be anyone that happens to come in and put their boot on the ground and say, "Yep, we're your new rulers." Doesn't have you have to separate. Loyalty, I guess, if you even want to have that, from the government and the ideal that was America, or the people of. Well, and, and I, I guess the the big issue for me is that at, at that point, if you are fighting for your country and not for the ideals that the country is supposed to represent, then aren't you just a nationalist? You're just fighting for your haven't, government. Haven't you become a... I mean, that, that's the same thing the Nazis were. They were nationalists. Germany, right or wrong, right? I think right. Germany fought for the um, fatherland, and Russia fought for the motherland. And we fight for the homeland. <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security wants to talk to you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, yeah, they probably do. Right. There's a diff- <laughs> No, there's just... Uh, it's what we get swept up in. I mean, when people... Uh, <clears throat> You know, you hear the national anthem or something, and go back to whatever happened to Justice. He talks about it quite a bit, the same subject of you hear the national anthem, you tear up or whatever, and people uh, think about the country. They get swelled up with pride or whatever. The government uses that against us to claim themselves as the country. So we give our loyalty to this idea of the government being that country, which is not. They're just a bunch of thugs ruling over us. It could be replaced with any other thug to rule over us. They are not the ideal. Our ideal was liberty. We, court- we just established that we do not have liberty, so we do not need to have this loyalty to the government. This government. Pick oh. your government. Who cares which one comes in and pushes their boot on your neck? The left side of your head or the right side of your head? Your face is still in the mud. 458 Talk is the number. By the way, I, I think we said it, but I want to make sure that we're clear to the veteran that just called. Thank you for your service. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, this is Bill. Bill, what's on your mind today? I remember when uh, my dad asked me. He was in uh, World War II 
And he said, out of the three sons, he wishes one of his son would join the military. And I always asked Dad, I said, Dad, what what did you do in the military? Because he never really talked about it. And he said, well, I was in tanks, you know, the old, uh, whatever, 92s or whatever it was. I can't remember exactly. And I, I thought, well, you know what, maybe out of one of his kids, maybe I'll join. So I did join, and I went through uh, basic training. And, and I remember basic training teaching me what it was like to be a team. We had to be a team. If it wasn't a team, uh, one person, uh, if one person fell, we picked them up and we all went together. We didn't, uh, we didn't lose our, our teammate, you know. And uh, the pride, I remember the pride. It, I, it grew in me as I, I became a uh, a private and then, uh, went through the ranks. And as I, as I got better pay and, and I became a, uh, a, a specialist and then a sergeant, I, I, the pride grew in me and I, and I tried to, uh, bestow that pride, uh, uh, into my other troops, you know? So I end up, I was, when I was in tanks, my job was to teach lieutenants who just come out of, uh, uh, officers candidate school to uh, to command the tanks and I I was a tank driver and I had to be also an E5 which uh, was capable of, of being a gunner as well it's like being a uh, a chief engineer on a boat a chief engineer on a boat can can uh, pilot the ship but he can't but in order for it to go across the ocean he needs a uh, a captain but within the harbor, a chief engineer can harbor, you know, can uh, steer the the boat. So well, these lieutenants would come in their butterballs. We called them butterballs, and they'd be uh, General Patton. I swear they were. Uh, they they come in with spit polish and and shine shoes, and and I can conquer the world. And 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 we tried. I tried to. Most of my time was to teach them how not to get killed because the first thing they wanted to do was rush in and kill everybody kill everything and and stand on top of the hill with the flag of victory and i had to stop them down every time i said sir look we can't do that we can't silhouette ourselves because if we do that the enemy will have there's more of them than there is of us so the odds are that we will get killed so at the time when I was in the military, we were our most enemy was the uh, was the Russians, and the Russians outnumbered us uh, five to one, and then it becomes seven to one, and uh, the whole time that I was in the military, <clears throat> uh, the captain would come to me, and he'd ask me. Bill, would you uh, come on my tank? And I said, well, why is that, sir? And he says, because I've been watching you, and I watch you with my men, and and I think you'd be a fine soldier to be on my tank. I would like you on my tank. And I said, but, sir, I would love to be on your tank if I could take Charlie 2-1 with me, which was my personal tank, which I had to make sure all the nuts and bolts were tight. And it was very dependable tank and he said no you'd have to go on my tank and i said i fell in love with that tank yeah anyway bill we got a bunch of other people on the line the moral of the story is is that these people that would come out of uh oit who thought they were so gung-ho is their the the pride that we have today is not there in the military it's it's more of uh, a job, you know. I see this uh, as a job, and uh, uh, it, it just—it's a different, a different uh, atmosphere of uh, military. Bill, that's and, exactly what I saw when I was in. I was in Bosnia in uh, '96, '97. And well, we that's exactly what I saw is that the most of the people that were there were not there because of the country. They weren't there for the Constitution. They were there for their college money. Exactly. But we lost our pride. We don't have any pride anymore in the United States. And this guy before me 
thinks that, okay, I put my pride in that military, that VA, uh, that representative of me when I was in the military, that proudness, that, that was my spot. I loved it. But uh, we lost the concept. The concept is not the fact that, that uh, we can destroy, we can become kings. The, the, the concept was that the pride of the United States has gone so awry that we cannot wave a flag without being uh, ridiculed or uh, 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 what's another good word for being put down, you know? Uh, well, uh, put down is good enough. I, I mean, that, that works, Bill. Uh, it, I, what does the flag represent? And I, I know I, I... To me, it represented uh, the strength of my country, my God, my power, my that I had, that strength in me through that flag made everything in the United States that I stood for. And now I've lost it. I, I can't because I don't have anybody above my military. My, my government left me in Vietnam. They left me behind. They, they, they walked away from me and didn't come looking for me when I got lost. Hmm. And 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 it was I was lucky to get back. You know, I was lucky. But uh, the thing is, is that when they turn their back on me, they not only turn their back on my flag, they turn their back mm -hmm. on my pride. That's where we're getting to the EPA. The EPA has no teeth. These A B C alphabet soup type of things, like the, uh, they have no teeth to govern us into putting us. They can't put us into jail. They can take our money away. They can fine us. But in, in honestly, we as a human race, a people, need to stand up against the EPA in this country, in this town, and say, look, enough is enough. I've worked hard, and I've been in here, and I want this country. This is my land. This is my Alaska. This is my flag. And you, EPA, you get out of here because you don't belong here. You're not here. You're not Alaskan. You're not in this flag. You're not the flag that uh, flies that, that star over the, 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 uh, uh, the Milky Way, or no, mm -hmm. the Dipper. You're not that flag. You're, you're another flag. I don't know what flag you are. But my flag now, the one that I sit under, the one that I'm proud of is that blue star that sits above that dipper and you need to go and you need to be forced out of here like that guy sitting in that tent down there at the memorial he needs to move that tent over to the epa and say listen here we all need to move over to the epa and we need to shut their power down we need to let them know that you don't belong in this town you don't belong here no more you need to go away so that we can live we can be proud again for this country that I come up here in Alaska and I fought for. That's why I'm here. That's why I want this town to be better than than the trash that it's in now. The people that you that you keep talking to every day, who sit that 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 sit here and say, I, "I'm proud. I'm so proud of this town. I want this town. I want to be part of this town." Well, damn you, you better be part of this town. And you better get your stuff acts together, or we're not going to have a town, and we're all going to have to go someplace else. And it's ridiculous of what's going on. That's my that's my pride. That's my love. So yeah. that's what I got to say about this. And Thank I, you. I'm telling you, I've served for my country, and my country is not serving me very well. Bill, thank you for the call, and thank you for your service. Well said. Four or five. <laughs> yeah. Just a moment of silence to soak in that call for just a minute. Let me, let, me, let me just throw this out for a moment. What if certain people, whether it is the Occupy Fairbanks group or maybe a group of veterans or, or somebody who would like to call themselves part of the Tea Party, if it still exists, or anybody were to take a tent and go over right there in that vacant spot between the river and the borough? Mm. It wouldn't be out there for, you know, it, it wouldn't be a huge... Uh, visible, you know, hey, look at me, you know, it wouldn't interfere because it's on the back side of the building. It wouldn't interfere with the borough's comings and goings. It wouldn't interfere at all. But it would be something that people could see, especially if they're on the river, the the uh, 
the visitors to our town could see in the summertime. It would irritate the It borough. would irritate the hell out of the borough That'd be if nice. we went out there and occupied that little portion of grass and put up a sign that said, get the EPA out or even, you know, whatever you want to say, get the borough out of my smokestack or, you know, whatever. Because if it weren't for the borough's local re- re- regulations, exactly like Bill said, the EPA would not have any power at all. Yeah, they don't have... They don't I mean, even have the power to take your money. money. Right. They don't even have that power. It's the it local the people that not to e- give you money. Exactly. Though. So. And who gets to spend that money? Yeah. The people that in that building that right building. over there at right. the borough. You and I don't get to. No. Nope. We. Uh, we get to contribute to. our money <laughs> involuntarily. It's just back to the sheriff of Nottingham, like we began this half it's, hour with. It's not involuntary. It's not involuntary. It's voluntary taxing. Yeah. You can go to jail. You don't have to pay it. But if you don't pay your, ta- your your taxes, we have been told again and again that you will lose your house. In fact, I talked to somebody who refused to pay his taxes, got sued, and lost his house. And here's what happens. If you don't pay your taxes and if they adjudicate that you need to lose your house, you will be evicted by force. It sounds like we don't own our homes. We have permission we to have, live in them. And we pay rent. By paying our Back property to taxes. We have no rights. Mm-hmm. All of them are permissions. I I wish that guy would get a couple hundred veterans together and go over to the go. EPA and tell them to get bent. Well, and that's the thing. The I EPA know, doesn't really have an them. office here. What the EPA too. has is the EPA has those little uh, those meters on top of the borough building and on top of the state building and out in North Pole. They have those little uh, meters that tell us what the air quality is, supposedly. <laughs> 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi, this is Gail. I just would like to make a suggestion that uh, Randy be part of your panel because uh, I think all of you, you three, kind of all think alike, and it would be good to have, uh, you know, a different opinion. Well, he calls in just about every Saturday. Yeah, but I mean to have him just part of your panel because uh, if you give him, if you get him heads up on uh, what the subject will be, he'll research it, and then he'll have, uh, you know, opinions. It's uh, it's good to hear what he has to say. Well, we don't usually have a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, when, when we come up with the the uh, the topic, it's about what five minutes before the actual start of the show. Four, five, five seconds. Five seconds. <laughs> Thanks for the suggestion. Four five eight dog is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Red. Red, what's on your mind? Our federal government is really screwy. They <laughs> let corporations in this country take and uh, manufacture something or get a patent or something, and then they send it over to a foreign country to make it. Our prisons are full of young men that should be on the street, and there's no, not because of violence, but it's because they don't have a job. And um, they, the federal government, if they're going to do their job, they should tax every company in the United States that ships anything overseas or any item, and then brings it back and pawns it off on the public. At least 50% of what it costs is a tariff. And Maybe those countries, uh, not countries, but those cities and the corporations would learn that it's better to hire American help and empty our prisons than keep filling them up. And that's what's happening today. Well, it's been happening for the last 20 years. If American I help wasn't thought, so damn expensive, Red, I think they'd be hiring Americans. Um, <laughs> I don't shop at box stores because every last time I went in a box store, I didn't see enough in American there. The beef man. Meat products were all coming out of Argentina, Chile, and stuff like that. All the vegetables were coming out of, most of it was coming out of Mexico. All the products you buy in store goods are made in China. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. It doesn't cost more to manufacture and produce in America because the labor is more, or that there's a labor shortage. It's because the regulation is more. You can't be competitive inside your own country against countries that don't regulate every aspect of life. That goes back to your full prison. Your pr- our prisons aren't full because of unemployment rates. Our prisons are full because every aspect of your lo- life is regulated. And if you don't get permission to do something, then you're going to get thrown in jail for violating the permission, which actually that goes back to the folks that are over there occupying uh, the park here in Fairbanks. Look at how many people have turned their attention against... These uh, y- these young men that are on, that are in those tents, instead of turning it like that last caller did against our real enemy, 
which is the government that is regulating us. I mean, if, if we are continually fighting each other, how are we going to stand up together, Aaron? I don't know, but here, here's a good example of what regulatory law gets you. My cousin, me and Josh's cousin, he uh, got pulled over on the way to work. Or, no, he got, uh, camera, his truck broke down, and so he missed a couple of weeks of work, and then he wasn't able to afford his insurance, and then he was driving to work, got pulled over for having a blinker out, got a no insurance ticket, wasn't able to pay the ticket, and so now he's in jail right this minute, and he lost his license. Well, going back... So <laughs> my point is, is he's in jail and doesn't have a job anymore. He was uh, working at Dairy Gold, by the way, had been for the last uh, 15 years, and now he didn't have that job anymore. And so when he gets out of jail... Where's his job? He didn't have well, permission. Well, by obviously, by not buying insurance, he is putting everybody at risk. <laughs> right, but... Uh, He's where, obviously trampling on the rights of others by not purchasing that product that where, we have been where is told the, that we must purchase. Where Where is the victim in that crime? The government. The only victim was the state's mandated law. Which is why he's in jail. When we go back to... Uh, what Red was talking about with the manufacturing, leaving whatever. Try to start a business here. Holy smokes! Go through all the licensing and all that kind of stuff. Then try to hire people. See how much it costs to hire someone, where you have to go through all the drug screening and all that good stuff. And then you have to have, let's see, you have to have staff. You have to hire someone to be a safety person full time, so mm-hmm. they can walk around making sure everyone's safe. Because of the government regulations, you don't want to break one because they'll break you. You have to hire a, uh, let's see, a, uh, what do they call him? Human resources mm-hmm. person. you got to have that guy because, you know, he's got to interact because if someone gets mad, they're going to go cry at the government and they're going to come in there and break you again. You have unreal taxes that you're paying out for those employees. You have tons of mandates that you have to do for the employees. You have price controls and how much you pay them. And so much of it comes back to the local level. I mean, you look at at every layer of government, we have these regulations and these interferences in our private lives. Right now, uh, Natalie Howard has introduced a, uh, a, a measure, I guess you'd call it, a resolution that basically asks the governor to please speed up the process of getting the Healy coal plant back online so that we can get some more affordable energy. And I appreciate the effort But we're still asking permission. And I asked her what would happen if an individual just simply, without permission, went out and built a power plant and put it online. Would they come in and physically, forcibly shut down that power plant? Yes. I think they would. Yeah, you have to have permission. They can't. You can't ever be government and Ah, allow someone. But you see, what if government did its job? What if our local government, what if the city of Fairbanks sent its police to protect that power plant from the federal thugs that came in and tried to shut it down? No, they get too much money. What if I had that's another point? What if the state troopers were to go out there and arrest these federal agents that came in and tried to interfere with our commerce or tried to interfere with our travel. I mean, you look at the people, the National Park Service, throwing 70-year-old men in the mud for failure to obey their orders. Well, I think we have a long history here. Um, If we're going to wait or rely on the state to protect no, exactly. your rights. <laughs> but but that, isn't that Good the luck. intention, though? Isn't that what the government is supposed to do, is to protect our rights? Protect property. That in itself is And it. instead, what is it doing? It is interfering, and it is taking our property. Yeah, going back to what's, what's read again. The only We don't need more government telling, well, if you manufacture over there and bring it back over here, we're going to tax you more. The government needs to get out all the way. Get it out of the way. Right, that was where I was going to take the whole point. Get rid of it. it t- taxing tariff 50% of everything that goes in and out isn't going to solve the problem. It just costs us more money to go down and buy some money. Thanks for the call. 458 Talk is the number. This is the Saturday morning wake up call. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? It's Cecily. Cecily, thanks for calling in. What's on your mind today? Well, even if you do pay all your taxes and all your. Uh, uh, you know, what they're asking you for, the 
they can uh, put a sign on your fence and tell you that you're you can't live there anymore and um the mayor can take um 19 thugs and steal all your stuff off your property and my brother is a veteran too and uh he's a He's older and and not as strong, and I guess I don't know what what they're trying to do to him. But yes, but Cecily, the people who lived around your brother decided that they didn't want him living there anymore. So they oh, so oh they, it was just one person. So they passed some new uh, regulations, basically, which made it so that the things that he had on his property were not allowed, and so that's why you see he didn't have he, permission. He didn't yeah. have permission, even though he had had permission when he started. The people around him, by majority rule. They but, decided they didn't want him any there anymore. So, you see, it's just democracy in action, isn't it? No, that was fictitious. There was no petition for him to move at all. That was just the mayor and his code man. It was uh, He asked for the petition, and there was no written. The neighbors didn't write their names on a petition for that. But, you see, if the mayor hadn't stepped in to get rid of this troublemaker that your brother is, you see, it might challenge all of the regulations that the city has. Because if we realize that we only have the power, that the government only has the power that we allow them to have, then if we decide we're not going to play by their rules, you know, all of their power crumbles. Don't you understand? Your brother had to pay the price. And, yeah, and the rent that I paid helped pay for, for them to steal all his stuff. <laughs> and my snow machine he was fixing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, Cecily, thanks for the call. Thank you. 458 Talk is the number. This is the Saturday morning wake up call. Good morning. Are you still there? Hey, are you there? Hey, who is this? Hey, this is Pete. I didn't know I was on the radio. Pete, what's on your mind? Hey, listen, hey, real quick. So you guys advocate for anarchy then, right? Is that correct? I don't, I don't think I advocate for anarchy at all. Well, well, wait a sec, because you don't want a land of permissions, because you say everything you have to do in your life you have to have permission for, so you don't want to have any permission to do anything you want. So basically, you want to do whatever you want without having permission. Is that correct? Um, sure. I mean, well, that's that's anarchy, by the way, if you don't know that. Is there that's something wait, well, is there something wrong with anarchy? Well, we've tried that. What, right? When did we? When did well. we? When did we try that and it didn't work out very well? We'll try history. Read back. We'll be right uh, back. Hang on, hang on, hang on. We got to go to the news. All right. Welcome to hour two of this Saturday morning together. I am Steve Floyd, and this program is called Patriots Lament. Joining us in the studio from uh, Bighorn Enterprises, one of the sponsors of the show, we've got uh, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. From Far North Tactical, the other sponsor, we've got uh, Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, back from his couple of weeks at that undisclosed location, we've got uh, Dave Giesel. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Steve. Would you uh, like to tell us any stories of your travels? <laughs> uh, That's not very a, interesting. You're not at liberty to say. They're really good ones. I really probably shouldn't tell <laughs> on the radio. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, gentlemen, right before the top of the hour, we got a phone call from a, a listener who I believe is still on the air, and I'm going to summarize his position and then ask him, to make sure that I got it right here. Basically, he accused us of advancing anarchy because we do not believe in having to have permission from the government to do anything, that we ought to be able to do whatever we want to do as long as we are not hurting somebody else or interfering with their property or their life. And I actually uh, don't disagree with that. However, he said that it doesn't work, and he said that we should look to history to prove that it doesn't work. Is that correct, caller? Hey, that's correct. Okay. Now, but, but wait, let's clarify, though, because you're saying you don't want permission from government. So what government are we talking about? Federal government, state government, local um, government? What exactly government are you saying? I don't think that it would make any difference what government, would it? Well, okay, so then let's go back to the point, though. The point is then you want to be able to live your life without having any have say, permission to do anything from anybody. Right. What? You, ha, what how? Somebody, how is the ownership so if, of yourself if you have to have permission? There's. Well, for instance, for instance, I put it this way: if I, if you where you're living, and I put up a pig farm next to you, because I have the right to do that, because I'm not asking your permission or do anything I want, because I can do that. Right. And 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 you should that should not offend you at all. Right. What right do I have to um, infringe on your free enterprise? Right. No, you're exactly right. So I can do that. And let's just say you don't like that smell of a pig farm and you move. Well, I move 
where you just moved and pulled up another pig farm. And I just keep following you around because I have that. Doesn't right. doesn't work economically. I mean, this well, is no, a re- this is a reductio hey, absur- ad absurdum argument, I'm and it just guy. no, it I'm doesn't work, dude. It doesn't world. work economically. You you want to talk about history and reality, and then you're pulling this hypothetical scenario out of thin air that's well, never ever happened, and you're trying to use that to prove your point that history uh, proves that the systemic well, use of violence is the best way to organize society. Well, I'm very well, confused. Let me, well, let me put you this way: if you look at early history, where anyone did what they wanted without any kind of permission. The strong always prevailed over the weak. That's the way it works. If you look at the 20th century where the nation state took over the entire world after the Wilsonian quest of World War I, the strong killed the weak in larger numbers by percentage right. and absolute than has ever been recorded also, in any right. other century also, of, Amer- of world history. Well, I'm going to go back. Hang, hang on a second, caller. Hang on a second. I want you to tell me exactly where in history that happened. Where did the strong take over the weak? Where did that happen? Well, the Romans. They did a great job with the Jews. Took them over. Right, but the that the, was the, state. The, the Romans were the state. <laughs> that was the state. The Romans were the state that were killing the, the people. The, the Romans was a culture, and it turned into a state. The Roman Empire, the state. Right, right, and they weren't oppressing the masses until they became the Roman Empire. The you state. look at you look at okay you look at any Indian nation any Indian tribe. Wait, wait, you're talking about North American Indian or the subcontinent I don't care, India? I don't care what I don't care what country you go to. I don't care what country. Pick any country you like. Look at early Indian tribes where they weren't a government; they were just a tribe, and they went in and took over whatever territory they want as long as they were strong enough to do it. How do wait wait? That's just the way it works. How do you know that? Just reading history. Now, of course, history oh, could be lying to okay. us. You know, I mean, we could understand so that, but that's the way it what's works. What's interesting is the. Uh, the North American Indians did a very poor job of self-eradicating themselves. <laughs> um, but when um, you know when the British showed up and the Spanish showed up via their uh, assorted empires, they did a much better job of eradicating these people because they had larger pools of stolen money to create guns from and kill everybody. What about scalping? Didn't the Indians do that, Dave? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Didn't yeah and the, the yeah and the Spanish the, scalp, the Spanish the would Indians, kill Indians, Indians by the thirteens in honor of Christ and the twelve apostles, um, and they would burn the women and children alive. So wait, wait, are you telling me that the Spaniards introduced scalping? <laughs> I, I don't know who introduced scalping, but I'm just I'm just throwing it out that the Indians on this uh, on the North American continent wait, wait, did a very poor job of eradicating themselves in their so-called anarchy. Wait, but when the state showed up, when when the Western European state showed up, it was much more effective at doing to, that to eradicate them. Let me, let me go back to the caller here. Let me maybe you can give me an, right. a, an example from archaeology. Is there an archaeological example of one society being obliterated by, or, or rather just the, the, the strong completely dominating the weak without having government to do it? Well, let's see here. Without having government to do it. Yeah, because to, to, you're basically saying that the only reason why, that, that without government we would all be killing each other, without government we would all be following each other around making pig farms. Uh, that that without government to keep us from hurting each other, that we would be hurting each other. And yet the only examples you can give me are the examples that have been inserted into textbooks that are taught by government schools that have no historic basis, in fact, no archaeological evidence of it happening. The only archaeolo- uh, archaeological and historical evidence being that those races were obliterated by the offending invading nation states that did it by the use of force of government yes or well no? well i guess i guess i know the only government that i could or the only history i could really give you is scriptural history of uh where abraham you know with lot and his brothers took off and they split up their own groups and the other kings in the area which there was no set government went after them you know uh, what, what is a king they, you know, is well, it, they is, set themselves up as a king, though. Well, that's my point. Even Abraham, you could consider himself as a king, even though he had his own group of people, and he set himself. And you can, I guess, you can call that a government, I suppose. Well, you, you know, know the, the, that, another that, another, that's another interesting thing. I, you know, I heard from the first hour that. Um, you know, you were accusing. Uh, I wasn't here because yeah. this is a totally separate show. Right, right. Um, <laughs> I heard that you were accusing these guys of, of advocating, um, you know, an, an anti-state society. And if you're really worried about that, don't worry about it. We're not doing that well. 
<laughs> I mean, well, I come back okay, from my I trip. Guess, I come I back from my trip, point. and the people I meet are still, you know, hey, let's kill each other and lock each other in cages and call that organized hey. society. So, so don't hey, worry, hey, we're wait, not wait, doing wait, we're wait, not wait. doing that hey. well. Don't worry about hey, it. I don't have a lot of time, but this is my point. The point is basically this: you guys are saying, hey, we got to have some rules. Obvious. Whoever makes those rules up, we have to decide who that is because we can't live anarchy. Is that, that correct? That is the problem because you're deciding who's going to make rules. There, are, there are already rules. It's called common law. Do all that you say you will do, and don't ingress on anyone's property or person. Who all the other stuff that, you're who, talking who about is just. Law? Who made that common law? The people did over the thousands of years. Read, I mean, wait, 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 you can find. You, you made. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. He made. He made reference to scripture. You will find it in the golden rule, my friend. It is the same basic thing. Do unto others what you would like them to do to you. Don't do anything to them that you don't want them to do to you. Right. And we no, can no, go I back to that. Scripture, too, with the, the Israelites. No, they didn't have a king for a long time. And when they did finally say, give us a king, what did God say? Bad. Bad choice. Bad You're choice. going to suffer from it. Hey, brother, we got to let right. you go. Appreciate the phone call. 458-TALK is the number. This is Patriot's Lament, who's, all right, looks like we managed to clear the lines. I think Dave called us failures. No, yeah. no, it's not just us though. It's him, Dave. No, you're a failure yeah, too. Don't worry. don't worry about it. It's like, no. it's like I don't even vote, and people are like, Rah, you support the wrong people. Don't worry about it. I don't vote. If you really believe that that's the only effective way to change things, don't worry. I'm going to be highly ineffective. Just let it go. But, but I by, think people, by, by I think you're people, not voting, you're actually voting for the wrong guy. Uh, well, if by choosing not to participate, that bothers people more than choosing to participate in a way that they disagree with, which I think says something about what people really believe is effective. I think people deep down know that talking about ideas is a lot more uh, powerful than than they would like it to be. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Uh, this is uh, Floyd. Floyd, thanks Steve, for calling. Steve, Steve Floyd. Oh, that's me. What's your, oh. <laughs> who's this? Who are you? This is John Galt. John Galt. All right, that, I'll accept that name. What's on your mind, John? Could you answer you one going? question How before? Going, who is? John who is? Galt? Who is John Galt? Yes, exactly. Good yeah, I don't know. All right, <laughs> go ahead. What's your What's your comment or question? My comment. I, I got two comments. One about the pig farm thing, you know, because uh, I bought a piece of property and this guy had a pig farm next door. And the thing put off so much odor on uh, it that I mean, it was like ridiculous. And so finally had to like sue him, like get rid of the pig farm. But that didn't work out. So what we did is we got some chloroform and fed it with the pig feet on uh, it. And the chloroform killed the, killed the odor of the pig. So <laughs> you worked, you mean you, you worked it out with your neighbor? Yeah. Well, the chloroform worked it out. <laughs> right, but I mean, you didn't go down I mean, and get you it. Can't, you, you can't stop a pig from farting, right? No. But you can change the smell. <laughs> right, but the point is, you didn't go down and get a tank or go No, I don't know, man, and bro. They could, I'm a little smarter than that. <laughs> anyway, I enjoy, I enjoy you guys' conversation, you know. Thanks. That's all it is, too. We're just having fun. Throwing ideas out, getting exactly. people worked up. Oh, yeah, and, you know, here's the thing is that if you don't know what you believe, then you're not going to sound very smart to other people when they're trying to talk about what they believe. If you don't know why you believe what you believe, you're going to sound like just about any other politician that's out there. Right, I was just about to say that that's never yeah, stopped well, people I mean, from voting for politicians. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, yeah, right. I mean, it's like, hey, you know, so you got a fart problem. You don't, you don't shoot the pig, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, anyway that, and the other the other thing I wanted to I, I listened to your your uh, your discourse, Mr. Floyd, and uh, and you're a very intelligent man. But I, I ran into this kid last night, all right, and uh, I was coming back from town. I got a ride with him, and uh, I said, "What are you doing?" He goes, "I work for the army." And uh, I said, "Oh shit, how long you been in?" It? And he's like, four, he said told me about four years something like that and and I said why don't you do me a favor and drop me out with this bar I'll buy you a beer and he goes oh no I don't drink and I said and he uh, he like 
Yeah, he said, I, I don't really go in the bars that much, you know. I said, that's cool. And uh, so I took him in there and they tried to give him an, you know, an ID check and all this stuff. And I said, all the guy wants is a glass of water. And I said, he's just got back from Afghanistan and, you know, they said, well, I said, well, you can't serve a guy who just got back from Afghanistan a glass of water, you know. I'll pay you for it. And, uh, anyway, you there? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. We're listening, man. Go. Yeah. And he was cool, nice guy, and uh, shot him game of pool. And I said, "It's done. Be it's kind of a damn shame you can go fight in a war in Afghanistan, but you can't even you can't even buy a, a glass of water. You can't you can't even buy a beer." And and I said the same thing happened to me. About right. we're coming up on the break. Need you to yeah. uh, get get. Uh, does this come to the point here quickly? All right. The point of the matter is, man of service in Afghanistan ought to be able to buy a beer. All right. Yeah, that is a good point. Thank you very much for the phone call. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? This is Josh. How you doing? Josh, good. What's on your mind today? I want to go back to the caller that was talking about uh, historical examples of anarchy and whether or not they uh, were less violent than uh, state society. Go ahead. And, uh, uh, there are a couple books that were written about the subject. Uh, it was covered in Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel a little, a little bit. This guy is uh, a biologist who spent uh, several decades in New Guinea with some stateless societies. There's another book by uh, Steven Pinker called... Uh, I think it's the Better Angel Angels of Our Nature. I can't remember exactly the title. Stephen Pinker's a psychologist. He's written uh, several books about how the brain works. And he, he makes a convincing argument that in large uh, states, you know, like uh, the United States, or where there's hundreds of millions of people, the violence levels on a per capita, you know, the percentage is slightly lower than when you're looking at talking about Neolithic tribesmen like in the highlands of New Guinea. So uh, there might be some evidence for that on a historical basis, but it reminded me of some graffiti that I saw that said, I'd rather have dangerous freedom than peaceful slavery. So that, that's kind of a separate <laughs> argument. You are such a revolutionary, Josh. I, I, I guess. You know what? I, I don't believe you have permission to say that. <laughs> well, my wife doesn't know I'm talking to you. <laughs> Hopefully, she's not listening. <laughs> well, this is you know you're you're, you're treading into danger right there, aren't you? There's yeah, the, exactly. uh, there's a like a little uh, internet kind of meme poster too that says um, arguing that people can't exist without the state is like arguing that animals didn't exist without farms. <laughs> oh, wow, that's a good one. Hey, thanks for the call, Josh. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, animals, welcome to Patriots farms. Lament. Who's this? This is Brian. Brian, what's on your mind? Uh, I've been listening to you guys, and I agree with a lot of what you say. I do believe we're way over-governed. But the one thing I've learned in my travels around the world is there's pretty much two types of people. There's the governed and there's the governing. And even in areas like uh, Western Sahara, which really doesn't have an organized government, one of the few places on Earth that's like that, there is governance. If someone's always going to, you know, stand up and say, I'm in charge, or they're going to impose their will on, on other people. So it's human nature that you're going to have a certain amount of governance. And it's also human nature that at some point people stop putting up with it. And that's what really spells the end of a lot of governments, especially tyrannical governments. And in this era that we live now, I think you're going to see less of the naked, widespread tyranny, the you know the closed-fisted type tyranny, because of our ability to communicate uh, what's what's going on. Which is why they need to shut the internet down. Absolutely. That is exactly why they need to come in and restrict our access to the internet. Because you know what, people are reading things and they're starting to get ideas, and that is dangerous stuff. Well, one thing, it might cheer you guys up a little bit, because you sound kind of grumpy today. 
<laughs> one thing that might cheer you up is I I have noticed a real uh, sea, sea change amongst liberals. In the last year, I had a conversation with three ladies yesterday who were, you know, I've known them to be traditionally uh, liberal people, and they were all griping about the liberal media and all the things that Obama and the government was doing, and uh, they had a long list of things that they found dissatisfactory with the current administration. So, you know, thankfully in this country of ours, we have a long tradition of rebellion, and that's not very common in a lot of places in the world. We also have a long tradition of that rebellion being squashed. <laughs> yeah, but you, you know, uh, I... I like to have a little or more co-opted. Hope, you know, the one, the other thing I wanted to mention was the whole the idea of uh, uh, one group or governing governing group coming in and killing another group of indigenous people or whatever. And you got to remember, if you've studied Native American history, um, there was a large number of tribes that just slaughtered each other wholesale, took each other's children, uh, you know, into slavery. Wait, which tribes? You, you go to lower 48 or up here, the Indians and the Eskimo rivalry was alive and well way into the 30s and the 40s. There were Eskimos who were deathly afraid of traveling through Indian territory and vice versa. And the an example I give people is... Um, I'm still deathly but, afraid of going to Anchorage, personally. But, that's, <laughs> but there was a, a huge battle between the Indians. Uh, there were two different groups of Eskimos up on the coast near Point Lay. And to this day, you can see some of the 4,000 skeletons that are laying there. So they... No no question about that. Um, yeah, I so was just, just remember that, you know, it's I, not all the white guys killing everybody. No, the, the, you know, it's been the, the other if, way around, and it's been between each other, too. One of the things that uh, people who are anti-state are, are kind of accused of is, well, they just say the state's the only bad thing in society. No. Bad people are no. the bad thing in society. No. This the state the state allows it to be centralized and made systemic. And so, so the the Indians, you know, with limited ability to to steal from each other and and uh, themselves, uh, had a limited ability to make large weapons to to really kill people. You know, what gave the British Empire its power over uh, India and the Middle East was the Maxim gun, mm -hmm. right? No one else had the Maxim gun. Uh, so it was a might makes right scenario. Well, and when, e even here in Alaska, look at what happened with the Quinkets with the Americans. Well, I was actually I was going to throw out a, a different example. I was out at Attu Island, which is uh, as far west as you can get. I still couldn't see Russia, so that <laughs> raises some questions. But I was out there. There were there were like something like 50 uh, natives, uh, Native Alaskans on that island when World War II started, and like 20 of them left uh, to a U.S. camp or whatever. Uh, to keep them safe, and 30 of them stayed. And the Japanese took those 30 prisoners as, as American prisoners of war, which is kind of funny because the people living out there did not identify themselves as American. Anyway, there were 50 people total on that island. Uh, in the battle between the Japanese and Americans on that island, a total of 2,000 people were killed on this on this rock that has no economic value in the middle of nowhere, right? So in the absence of the state, the most people who could have been killed on that island was 50 because that was the most people who were there. And then these two states go to war, and they're like, oh, we're going to battle over this totally worthless piece of rock. Let's send a bunch of our kids there to kill each other. And so you have 2,000 people dead uh, as a result of you know, a, a larger nation-state society as opposed to like a tribal society where there's limited resources to go around killing other people. Dave, I'm going to have to ask you to stop thinking. <laughs> it's the efficiency of, of uh, mayhem that government, government is really good at. Uh, if you look at the most efficient or I should say effective, maybe not efficient, but the most effective portions of our government, I think the, the military, by and large, is, is far more effective at what they're supposed to do. And whether you like it or not, you know, your job is to break things and kill people when you're in the military or support that activity. That's what, that's what it's there for. Yeah, there's, there's actually like a fundamental reason for that, um, which is that the means 
means and ends are inextricably linked, right? And so the means of government existing is coercion, systematic theft, uh, locking people in cages, all these sorts of things. So very like lowly means. And killing somebody is a lot easier to do than uh, convincing them to buy your product. And so the state fundamentally <laughs> is good at doing coercive activity because that's what it's based on. Uh, the reason the state has a hard time doing anything economically correct is because economic activity is based on voluntary exchange if it's going to be successful. And because nothing the state does is to exist is voluntary. Well, look at the Chevy Volt, it's, Dave. It's Come very on. important. And look at well, all of the people who are out there buying the Chevy Volt well, voluntarily. Yeah. Well, this through the subsidies. Yeah. And, there, and there's like five people who have bought it. But even, <laughs> even if you look at like the, you know, the services, like the post office, the schools, things like that, these could be operated efficiently. We could have better services at lower cost for more people. But because the state thinks... Like homeschool? The, the state thinks from a coercive Private basis... School? Yeah, but I mean, you, you could, you, they could be run more efficiently, but because the state, all of state action is based on a coercive basis where economics is thrown out, voluntary exchange is thrown out, they're very inefficient at doing those things. But yeah, the call is right. They are very efficient at killing people. All right, we're coming up on the Fox News here at the bottom of the hour. If you are thinking about calling in, now would be a great time. You can get on hold. We have one line open, 458-TALK, or you can join us in the chat room, kfar660.com on the World Wide Web. We'll be right, 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 right back after the Fox News. We might be right, left back. I'm not sure. All right, that's the group called Group One Crew with uh, their song "Forgive Me." You are uh, listening to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. We are local talk radio. I'm Steve Floyd behind the microphone on this side of the board. On the other side, we've got Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises, and we've got Dave Giesel from. The Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, and I think I speak for everybody here in saying that the purpose of this program is not to try to convince you that you're wrong and that we're right. The point of this program is not try to convince you to get involved with a political group or contribute to any particular political party. If anything, the point of our program is to get people to think and draw your own conclusions instead of accepting the pablum that other people are shoving down your throat. Am I right? Yeah. yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting about the whole convincing people uh, that we're right, you know, whatever. Um, when I first kind of st- started exploring these ideas, I-, I really was motivated to do that. I was like, oh, I figured it out. I just need to convince everybody else now. And then uh, that that wasn't like just a an end state, right? I've learned a lot more since then. Um, a lot of new views, new opinions, stuff like that. So somewhere along the way, I realized... That if I go around trying to convince people to think the same way I do, I'm just going to have to go back later and, and and explain to them, no, I was wrong. But now I have it figured out. Now you need to believe what I say. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's a, a really silly thing to try and convince people that you're right. Yeah, it is. But we still we're putting the ideas out just to have people think, really. I mean, just well, to get people to think. Well, yeah, I, I think even like throwing the ideas out there and waiting for somebody to call in with a, you know, legitimate, well thought out, uh, total evisceration of the ideas. Oh, right? absolutely. That would be the way that they would be delegitimized. Stick a hook and, in the guts and pull it out, man. Right. And this one. And and so that's kind of that's how you test your ideas, right? You throw them out, you bounce them off people, and you see, okay, is this consistent? What do other people think about this? You know, one person who has done that for me consistently over the last uh, what two years is Natalie Howard. Oh yeah, over sure. there over there at the borough assembly. Having her as a guest on Wednesdays has absolutely been one of the most stretching things for my mind that I've ever had. And I mean, I'm. Hmm. I is a college graduate. I mean, actually, no, I, I went through, I, I managed to cram a, a four-year degree into five and a half years, and then, <laughs> then and then I went and served in the Army, and then I went back and got my, my master's, and I am learning more from the conversations with Natalie Howard than I think I have, than I learned in all of that formal schooling, because she is very, very Socratic in her method. Yeah. She asks questions, and she makes me defend not only what I say I believe, but my actions, because very often our actions are inconsistent with what we say we believe. Yeah, no, that's, to- that's totally true. And and if you don't explore the boundaries of both your thoughts and your actions, you're you're never going to know. You know, you're just you're in the middle and you're staying safely in the middle. So you're never going to know what's possible. Right. And so, uh, you know, exploring those boundaries is uh at least part of what this show is about. I mean, before we go back to the phones, one quick example of that would be in terms of how many people do you know that say that they are small government, that do that want to get rid of government subsidies, but then also accept 
their very own government benefits. Yeah. Or how about when we start off uh, the show explaining that everything we do is permission. We have mm-hmm. no liberties anymore. Everything is permission. We've had, what, three or four people call in defending that? Mm-hmm. That's, saying that that's, that's the, the point of the show, right? Which is anyway. you know, and that's a very they're just in the they're just in the middle, they're in the center, and they're exploring that safe idea realm, right? How dare you go out there and put up a tent? You're camping on public property. Well, actually, well, yeah, I mean, there's that, but we get accused of how dare you talk about a possibility that is very remote, right? Yeah, we get in trouble. <laughs> we get in trouble from our callers for just talking about ideas, which is which is interesting. All right. Um, we wanted to actually talk about uh, a movie that's out oh. uh, that I saw earlier this week on on some recommendations, and, and a friend of mine wanted to go. And Josh just saw it last night. It's uh, The Hunger Games. And uh, have you seen that yet, Steve? I, I have not seen it. I've been hearing from people that it's it's really really violent and disturbing. Um, it is disturbing, but the violence is not the disturbing part. Uh, no. I think they're disturbed for other reasons. It poses some very interesting and deep questions and it it's uh it has a lot of kind of metaphor and, and allegory to reality so so the premise of the movie is um you're, you're in this kind of dystopian future where you had the united states or some nation whatever and there was a collapse and, and a civil war and it broke into these uh districts right after after everybody you know killed each other and everything they, they settled into these 12 districts and um in order to make sure that they would never have war again, they decided that they would set up this system of conscription where each district would have to give uh, two children between the ages of like 14 and 18 or something like that every year. So 24 kids total, 12 districts, two kids, uh, a male and a female from each district. And they would engage in this televised fight to the death uh, for the honor of their district, right? And for the greater honor of the of the state, right, is, is the underarching kind of theme. And so uh, it's like the 74th year of this competition. And uh, these these kids from the poor district, well, specifically this girl from the poor district. Don't, don't give any spoilers just in case we want to go see it. Well, she gets she gets conscripted, right, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the point is the the whole game only works. It's televised. It's the bread and circuses, right? It's the whole, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's the whole Roman thing, but the the game only works if the kids cooperate and kill each other, right? And the game only works if everybody decides they're going to watch. And so, like right at the beginning of the movie, this this girl's uh, boyfriend is like, "What if everybody just stayed home? What if nobody watched? It would it would end, right? They would stop doing it." And then throughout the movie, you're, you're introduced to that, you know, non-compliance uh, theme through multiple ways, right? There's probably three or four ways that the whole thing could be stopped if people just chose not to comply at a certain point, uh, right? Nothing big, just, you know, no huge action, you know, just not watching or choosing not to kill each other. Uh, just saying, no, we're not going to we're not going to dance, right? We're not participating. Right. We're not going to play your game. And... Um, the other theme that I – that's just one of the themes. That's, which a, is, you know, that's which, a theme that we've struck on this program a number of times. <laughs> I know, and it's really funny because the, the power of noncompliance, the power of just saying no thanks is really uh, really emphasized in, in the film and kind of the structure of, of the society there. But there's another interesting angle on it, which is the, uh, the kids from the richer districts – actually go to these special schools. They don't have to conscript anybody from the richer districts because they they almost always win the game because they have these schools set up where the kids go to learn to, you know, be uh, awesome killers, whereas the poor people in the poor districts are just trying to eat. And so their kids actually have to work. And so they can't learn, you know, all the art of, of battle and everything like that. And so you have you have a volunteer army, if you will, from like the districts one and two. And they usually <laughs> they usually slaughter the poor people from the other districts who are just trying to eat uh, quite efficiently. And so the resistance to the the resistance to the game to the hunger game is much lower in the wealthy districts than it is in the poor districts because the wealthy districts usually win the game. Um, that has nothing to do with Afghanistan. It right, certainly has nothing to do with yeah <laughs> or Iraq or, or yeah or war in general or, or the Uganda. empire in general. You could talk about the British Empire if, or Libya. If talking about America makes people too too scared, you could talk about the same thing with the British Empire or um, you know what the French did in North Africa or anything. Uh, and so there's there's all sorts of themes like that just kind of buried in the movie, waiting for people to scratch the surface and uncover them. 
and it's a it's a real mind stretcher, definitely. Right. Definitely. What was your? Uh, go see. Yeah. What was your? Did you have anything? Yeah, kind of the. Actually, it was a little bit too. It's almost real. Not the actual story. You know, obviously we don't have a Hunger Game per se like that. But all the analogies that are along with it, with the state, it's just, it was almost creepy in that way for me because it's like, wow. Yeah, I can see that happening here. I can see that it, it is happening here. The glory, it was funny when they talked about, uh, you know, the glory of dying for these people, the glory of dying for the Hunger Games. And the kids didn't want to die, but they were told how glorious it was from... From the people that weren't going to die, of course. Mm-hmm. The, it was the old, right? All yeah. the people who run the game are, are old enough that they don't, they're don't they not in the lottery for it. Right. I thought that was pretty uh, funny. It's also, you know, there's this thing, the poverty draft. You guys know what that is? We don't have a, a draft in this country anymore, but most of the people who sign up for the military are from really low-income families because that's their economically that's their best option and the officers generally speaking generally well generally speaking they're not from you know as low income but, well, but even to, even if you go, just, they have to go to college in order to if, become an officer sure right mm-hmm. but even if you just cut it political class versus the people actually doing the fighting in this country politicians all go to law school right they're all from columbia or harvard or someplace like that where they learn nothing but they get the right piece of paper and generally, they're they're quite well off, and they never serve. You know, Newt Gingrich talked about how he, you know, I got all these waivers, so I didn't have to go to Vietnam. Blah 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 blah. Um, and he's proud of it. Right. And and whereas the people they're sending, the reason they're signing up for the military is because they're that's their best economic option. It's a it's a poverty draft. You don't have to conscript these people because their their options to earn an income to eat are so limited that the uh, Joining the military is their best option. And in in the Hunger Game, one of the interesting things is in the poor districts, uh, the more food that the kids eat, the more times they're entered in the in the lottery because they can't. It's like they're Everything they're like mortgaging true. their future, right? It's almost like a student loan thing or something like that. Um, <laughs> wow. Anyway, no, it's wow. it's just it's it's rot with that kind of stuff. It's just chucked full of it and. Uh, that sounds like a dangerous movie. An, another friend of mine, he drew a whole parallel. He said, "Oh, it's like the it's like the public schooling system where you're, you know, you're taken, you're you're put on this bus. You haven't committed a crime, but you're taken on this bus every day, or your parents go to jail, and you know, you're locked in this uh, in this building essentially where, you know, you can't. All sorts of activities are prohibited, um, and you have to do X, Y, and Z. And it's basically in in a lot of schools, especially like." poor schools in the ghetto you have like a mob rule within the school where you have the you know the bully or the gang in the school is actually the de facto rule right and the teachers just kind of step back and let the kids you know kind of have at it um not true in all schools but certainly true in in a lot of you know larger and that's not true anarchy either because it's it is no because they wouldn't be there nobody's there voluntarily it's like i mean that's like saying you have anarchy in a prison well i mean the prisoners aren't aren't there voluntarily you know, and certainly if you haven't, you don't have an accurate slice of society. You've taken a specific group of people, um, be they, you know, children mm-hmm. without cog- developed cognitive ability, you know, and you say, hey, have your own society. Lord of the fly. <laughs> right, exactly. Lord I think the best the part of the whole movie, that this should make you want to go see it, is when one of the characters says, well, they have to have their games. And the other character says, no, they don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's and, and it's way song. powerful. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like really powerful. powerful. All right. All, yeah. of, all, all of our lines have been on hold since the half-hour break, so uh, maybe we should check the lines. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, Caller. Are you still I with us? just go watch the movie again. <laughs> hey, uh, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Hey, who is this? Hi, this is Tim. Tim, go ahead. Um, I got uh, two points uh, from earlier on the show. They asked for an example of uh, native on native. Well, in northern Minnesota, the Chippewa ended up, well, they got forced from back east, and they were better armed than the Sioux. That's how the Sioux ended up getting pushed into the plains. But, you know, with their governmental structure, they didn't pursue to finalize the situation. They didn't, you know, defeat the Sioux utterly. They simply made it difficult enough to push them out onto the plains instead of, you know, putting them onto reservations where they could control them and and better, uh, you know, liquidate them. That took the uh, uh, advancement of civilization to do that to the Chippewa and whatnot and then to the Sioux later on. And then you had a a caller ask, you know, where where is the basis for the laws that, 
you anarchists supposedly are going to follow, and you said common law. Well, it's common law, and and it is uh, uh, from scriptures too. Things how supposedly we're a Christian nation, and uh, so when that discussion came along, I'm going, geez, didn't I remember somewhere about you know property or this, that, and the other thing? So I called up the uh, Ten Commandments and. Basically, what uh, should uh, um, very definitely are in common law is uh, number six, you shall not murder. Uh, number eight, you shall not steal. And then here's the big one for proper, uh, property and whatnot. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his manservant, maidservant, his oxen, his donkey, or anything that's your neighbor's. So common law is based on uh, Judeo-Christian principles, which are very much a, a demand that you must respect another's property. And uh, I don't know, I'm, <clears throat> I serve on the Planning Commission now, and uh, all, you, all you see when a person has to come begging the state to be able to use their property as they, as they wish is you have other people that surround them mm -hmm. and whatnot who are coveting their neighbor's mm -hmm. property, saying, uh -huh. no, you can't do this. If, if if I can't do this or if I don't have the means to do this, I don't want you to do this either, and I'm going to use the state to stop you from doing it. You missed you miss the fine print there when you were reading those ten suggestions. There at the, bo at the bottom it said, unless you're government. <laughs> because, uh, and you think about it, who has the right to, to kill people? Who has the right to take from people by force? Who has the right to, to steal? To, well, yeah, well, and, and to, to covet. I mean, what are, the, what are taxes except coveting what you have? I mean, it's all, am I right? Yeah. There's a government exemption for that, and you, you just have to make sure you fill out the right form there at the bottom. Um, well, but there are, there are kind of exceptions uh, for people also. It says, you shall not murder. And you go and you have to look and go and say, uh, do you have circumstances where the individual is not murdering someone if, one, they are protecting themselves or uh, or another? So, so I mean, there there is a little fine print on some of this, but uh, I don't see anywhere in the Ten Commandments that uh, you shall serve the government. Well, and, yeah, and it's interesting. Underneath the Ten Commandments, it doesn't say, you know, these only apply if you're in a state society. Yeah. Oh, now, Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, what's on your mind? Well, I just want to hearken back to your previous hour. Some very nice lady called in and used my name, Randy, and said, uh, Randy ought to be a sure? guest. And I thought that was very nice. I have no, no idea who that lady is. I have to go back to my recording and even catch her name. But anyway, I wanted to say that I think this show is good just as it is. Don't want to have too many cooks in the kitchen. Right now it's a well-oiled machine. And, uh, Thanks, Randy. And also, uh, it's doing a very good service. It's a thought-provoking show. I don't agree with everything that's said, but no, no two people are going to agree about I, it. I wouldn't want you to. Right, right. And uh, but what this show does do is it 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 brings out it's a unique show it's a it's a counterpoint far on the on the freedom side of the scale and it's a good counterpoint to the left wing to the communist side of the scale and it is and I've never seen quite a show quite like it but anyway uh, uh, it is good it, it, everything's right with the world as long as the show which you do let counterpoints call in and, and as far as me for instance just talking about myself. It's easy for me to sit here for many, many minutes, 30 minutes, and dwell on one single point and research it, maybe consult my computer or something and put some notes down and, and call in. It's much harder to be there where you are, uh, carrying everything on the fly. And the hard work, of course, is working hard and paying for the show that Josh Bennett and Aaron do an admirable job of doing. So I really appreciate the show. And um, um, anyway, enough of that. But Thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs> just to call in to make my little little jab point or whatever, a little contrary point. We're waiting for it. Go ahead. Come and, on. And that is, our the, our nation's life is kind of like hanging in the balance right now with the Supreme Court decision on Obamacare. We don't really know how they're going to decide. But I am so grateful if they decide in the right way and save our life, which we did a miserable job of saving ourselves through our vote. Uh, if they do a good job, it will be a lesson that it sure is good to have the right president to appoint the right Supreme Court justices, and that's why it is important 
to get the right president in there that's going to appoint the right Supreme Court justices. Yeah, well, we kind of went through this last week. I don't know if you were able to listen in with, uh, for one, letting our uh, rights be decided. I, okay, picture this in your mind. Do you really think that the founding fathers, when they they fought a revolution, okay, they uh, not just them, they're uh, the farmers. They fought for this revolution. They fought for this liberty. You think that they did all that to let nine people be the arbiter arbiter of Re your replace the king with freedom with a group of nine people. Those nine people, actually, I think it was five in the beginning, but. They never intended it to be. That's this is beside the point. But they never intended for five, nine, or whatever judges. Why did they call to be, it the Supreme Court then? It was all that was just had to do with governmental powers, federal power in relation to the state. Otherwise, than that, back to the president part. We talked last week about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's the biggest commie on there supposedly. She's the only one that's consistently stood up for the Fourth Amendment time and time and time again, mm -hmm. and she's the communist. Mm-hmm. But she stands for the fourth against all odds. Again. Eight to one, she says, no, that violates the Fourth Amendment of people's right to search. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, here's here's an interesting point, though, too, so. <laughs> Josh, is that most people support the Fourth Amendment as long as it's their Fourth Amendment. But if you talk about trying to defend the Fourth Amendment rights of somebody else, well, you know, now you're getting into some fuzzy area because some people, they don't deserve to have that right. They ought to be stopped. I mean, think about the whole reason why we have the Patriot Act. It's so that we can stop people that we think might cause trouble. Well, and last week, too, the whole point of the show was quit giving the presidency so much honor. Down with the presidency is what the point of it. Quit letting one man's position, who cares who it is, it's the office itself is the evil. Mm -hmm. Quit giving it so much honor. Well, and it's, if, it's not supposed to have that. And if the courts and who didn't cares have about the, these nine people that are going to decide what. So what if they decide that Obamacare is correct? Does that make it correct? You ask me? No. It yeah. Does, no, it no, does it not. Doesn't. No, it's a horrible travesty. It, exactly. So who cares what they say? I mean, the whole point is what. Yeah. I try to keep coming well, and, back and, and, here. The only reason is who cares what they and say. And take it out of the realm of that. Take it back to one of the previous callers about the issue of common law, about the issue of the Ten Commandments. What if the Supreme Court decided that it would be right to murder, Randy? Would uh, it be well, right to murder? What if, it, what if the Supreme Court decided that it would be right to kill children yeah. under a certain age? Yeah, no, no, that Say would under right. the age of zero months. That's, let's say the court decided that it was right to kill children while they were still in utero. Yeah, it doesn't make it right, no. Exactly. So nothing they say, whether right or so who cares what they say, basically. Well, well I, I care, don't care. I, I care because the government, as you so well point out, has the force of law. And if they say it's right, the government can come with its guns and force us to buy insurance and force insurance companies to have to cover because different we, people. And that's reality. But I mean, what if you did it? But, <laughs> what if you don't, Randy? Okay, look, what happened when uh, Nero decided that he was going to blame the Christians for what happened in Rome? What happened to the Christians? Were they well, completely eradicated? No, but some of them were. <laughs> yeah, some of them were. And, and, and their blood ended up completely changing society forever because it helped to change minds because they were consistent with their actions. They said it is not right that I should give you, the emperor, the honor that is due only to God. I will not do it. I would rather die than do it. It's You're right. Reality is they have the guns they can kill us. The point here is get out of the surf mindset. Okay, even if they lock you up in jail, get out of the surf mindset that whatever they do, oh, well, they're the government. That's the mindset we got to get out of. Oh, I'm be, quit, I've been arrested. I must have done something wrong. Quit letting them. This, there's another solution. I'm not going to – I don't care – what the Supreme Court decides, because I'm leaving the country before that comes into law. There's other ways out. Well, yeah, I'm taking everybody's more. advice. You don't have to call in and tell me to leave anymore. I'm doing it. <laughs> Voting yeah. with his feet. <laughs> Thanks the for the call, the Randy. The last vote you're going to make in the United States is <laughs> vote with your feet. 458 dog is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? You talking to me? I might be. Depends on who it is. Um, my name's Steve Loves Michaela. All right, Steve. I know. It's Steve. Anyway, um, yeah, Bastier, was it Frederick Bastier that said uh, the government is out of control when it, it, it takes uh, liberties that are uh, illegal for the citizen? Yeah, he basically said when the uh, when the rules become asymmetric, right, when it 
when it well, that's, that's get, been going on for a while. We know that. Well, it's almost actually inherent in the idea of most states, right? And and he was kind of pointing that out in a really gentle way because he didn't mm. want to be too uh, uh, too much like we are on this show. Uh, yeah, but yeah, he totally he totally made that point. He said if the government gives itself exceptions to the rules that apply to everybody else, what do you think you're going to end up with? Yeah, that's what we've got. Anyway, I wanted to. I know you guys don't need a computer to keep your mind straight. I've been listening for a while here, and I don't have my computer in front of me. But you know, we can talk about a multitude of problems. But let's think about uh, the Frankfurt School and this uh, critical theory, and uh, you know the. Uh, Control that's being inflicted with uh, political correctness, which is basically, you know, critical theory in a, in a social science uh, application. So, you know, that's that's rampant in this country, and it's pushed on everyone, and pretty much everybody is kowtowed to it, and uh, it's not uh, unintentional. So, you know. All right. When you have when you have uh, thought control and then and then later on you know thought crime or uh, you know oh, look at look at all the so called hate crimes that are happening yeah. right now what yeah, what makes you know, it a hate crime need, yeah. you know if if you if you go and you beat somebody up exactly it's just a crime yeah. what what makes it a hate crime is if you say something <laughs> inflammatory before you beat somebody up well, it's yeah hate crime is like you know liquid water. You know, or, <laughs> wait, are you saying right. that all nutrition crime? food, you know, <laughs> all right. well, remember that well, crime you know, that was committed out of love? Yeah. Well, you, oh, yes. I do. The way love that, uh, crime. Psychology has been pushed on everyone is particularly the Freudian, you know, uh, fixation with uh, the uh, dominance of the father and, you know, the whole sexual garbage. It's, it's, it's effectively in the last 60 years turned everybody's perceptions of, uh, Christian morality and uh, social uh, acceptable behavior on its head. What was aberrant and deviant, you know, and antisocial 60 years ago is now considered normal. And anybody who wants to stand up and say, well, that's unchristian, you know, and that's bad for society, and it certainly isn't, and I think you know what I'm talking about, and the lead- listeners probably do too. Well, there, here comes political correctness saying, oh no, you're. You're uh, in, imposing on those people, those groups. You know, you well, the, uh, the Mennonites and the Amish have stood up against war, so at least there's a couple Christians out there who are actually holding the line on thou shalt not kill. Action points today. A couple of books that were mentioned. Go out and read them. Whatever Happened to Justice by Richard Mayberry and the other one, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Who was that by? Do you remember? Uh, Diamond. All right, so go uh, look those up and do some reading. And oh, for Pete's sake, think for yourself, people. Thanks for being here. You can check us out online. Go What's watch the website? Hunger Games. Oh, what? yeah, there's the action point. Go watch Hunger Games. Uh, PatriotsLament.blogspot.com. All right, there you go. We will see you next week right here on KFAR. Health Talk is next.